Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5, I'm going to, the focus of my passage this morning is going to be on uh, the first five verses. I am going to also include verses, uh, is it 10 and 11 or 11 and 12? It's 10 and 11. I'm also going to include those verses. I want to tell you right up front that, well, let me go ahead and read. Let me, let me read the first five verses as we start here. So Romans chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. He says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in the hope uh, and hope of the glory of God. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance character, and character hope. And hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out into our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. So, probably a very popular passage, probably a passage that you know, a passage you've heard. Some of you, uh, maybe a passage that you've memorized, very popular. However, I want to I wanna have a, maybe a different, actually it's not different, but maybe it is, maybe a little different emphasis. I, what I'm going to do and what I'm doing today in my my emphasis for today coming into the sermon was to talk about joy. And actually, I think I want to spend a few weeks, uh, maybe one more week, maybe more than that, I don't know, but just talking about joy and talking about people being able to find joy. And you say, well, this passage really isn't about joy. It really isn't about joy except that the fact that rejoice and glory and rejoice in this passage are used over and over again. So in a way, it is kind of about joy, uh, just because we don't always look at it that way and see it that way. But you know what? You, we just There are so many people these days who just lack a real joy, all right? And so now, look, I'm not talking about being happy, okay? Um, joy, it's bigger than happiness, yeah. It transcends happiness. Joy is different than happiness. Joy is something else altogether. You see, I can be unhappy and still have joy. You see, here's the deal. Happiness is dependent upon my circumstances, really. Happiness, if I put my tooth under the pillow and wake up and there's a $100 bill, not because I'm older. It used to be a dime. What is it now? A dollar, Okay. So, you know, but, you know, that's, that makes me happy, right? That would make me uh, happy. Look, when a hurricane comes through and knocks all my fence down and I have to get up there and start taking the fence apart so that I can pick it back up, I'm not a very happy camper. I'm not a yard guy. Anyhow, I don't like working in the yard in the first place. And now here I am out here picking up limbs, dragging them up to the yard, picking up all them pine cones. I wish every pine tree in southeast Texas would just die. I am sick and tired of pine cones and pine limbs, pine, uh, pine tree limbs after 25 years. I'm just tired. I'm tired of them. That, I just, I'm tired of them. If you have pine trees in your yard, God bless you. If you like them, I'm not sure about you. No. But, you know, I'm not happy. But you know what? Even though I'm not happy about the circumstances of my life, I can still find joy. I may not be happy about things. There's nothing that can make you more unhappy than to watch your kids or possibly your grandkids go through a difficult time or go through something hard. There is really nothing that can probably affect your happiness more than watching your kids struggle or your grandkids struggle through some sort of situation in life. But you know what? I can be in this life, and I can be in a period uh, where I am unhappy about circumstances, and yet I can still find a joy. Because deep inside, there is this confidence that I know that God has a plan. And not only do I know that God has a plan, I know that God is at work. And not only do I know that God is at work, I know that actually God can do anything. He can do anything. He can, he can correct any situation. And I know that God is capable. And so it keeps me from falling into this despair. Because you can find yourself in situations of life 
where it would be very easy to just be in complete and total despair and to just want to throw your hands up and to just, and to just want to say, I quit, I give up, I'm done, I, I can't do it anymore. But, but there's the Lord, the Spirit of God, deep inside of our hearts, put something in our hearts that gives us this little bit of joy so that we don't come to that place, so that the darkness does not com completely envelope our minds and our hearts and our emotions, and we can get up and we can face each day and we can kind of see a little bit of a light and we can have a little bit of a positive attitude as we know we're going to move forward in the hands of God and with God by our side. We need some joy. There's too many people that live without joy. Now, again, I understand that this passage isn't your typical joy passage, but I want us to try to look at it as such. And I know as I begin uh, in, in explaining the passage, it, it's really not about joy, but trust me, we're going to get there. So first of all, Paul says in verse 1, he says, being je therefore, being justified by faith, he says, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So he, it, this phrase, justified by faith, he actually spends, I'm going to say chapters 3 and 4 at least, and, and maybe even back a little farther, he actually spends chapters 3 and 4 trying to explain what it means to be justified by faith and what that means. And so the idea of being justified, I guess it just sort of, you know, I got to sort of put it theologically, uh, but it is uh, that you are righteous before God. But you are righteous before God only because God has declared it to be so. That God himself has said you are righteous before God. Now, how does that happen? Because the fact is, I'm unrighteous, and I know that. I am a sinner, and I know that. I fail every day. I'm not even righteous within my own family. How am I going to be righteous before God? I'm not even righteous at work. How am I going to be righteous? I'm not even righteous. I'm not even righteous with my dogs in the backyard, okay? How am I ever going to be righteous before God? The only way I'm going to be righteous before God is because he has declared it to be so. And the reason he declares it to be so is because he has sent his son, Jesus, to take our sin, mine, yours, and everyone's, to take our sin, to take it to the cross, to die with it, to take it in the grave, to leave it there, and to be risen, and to be rose, and to be rose, to be risen, to be risen again uh, uh, on the third day, and leaves our sin there. And it is through that transaction that we become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. God declares us to be righteous. Now, here's the deal: you don't do anything to get that. I, I need you to understand that you do nothing to receive that. It is a gift of God that God offers to us and that God gives to us. And the only way to obtain it is by faith. And so in chapter 4, Paul is trying to drive this home. He's saying, look, and he uses their great patriarch, Abraham, to show that even Abraham was not justified by his works. We like to think that the Old Testament people were justified by their works. They weren't. Paul says that by the works of the flesh shall no by, by the works by works of the flesh shall no one be justified. No one, even even Abraham, he wasn't justified by his works. He was justified by his faith. Let, let me read the first the first uh, what I want to read the first five verses maybe. Um, now let me read verses three through eight. So he says, "What do, of chapter four of Romans? What does the scripture say?" Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. That really is the core of it right there. Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Abraham had faith. He believed in what God said. He believed that the promise that God made, God could do. He believed God and that's where he got his righteousness. The same is true for us. We believe God. We believe his promise of salvation. We believe his promise in the way he has offered us salvation. And when we believe that, that's when we are counted to righteousness. Uh, verse 4, because to him who works, wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. If you got to do anything to earn it, it's not grace. And we're, it's by grace we're saved. But if you have to do, if you have to clean your room to get that dollar bill, that's not grace. You understand that? If you have to clean up your life before you can be saved, that's not grace. 
You understand that? And it is by grace that we are saved through faith. It is simply believing that God's promise that he is able to fulfill it. Verse 5. But to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. You see that? You see how he's just, he's very clearly pointing out that it's not about works. It's about faith. It's just about believing God. I want to skip on down and I want to read verses 19 through 22. Um, and not being weak in faith. Now, uh, just in case you're not familiar, so Abraham had several key components, several key elements and times in his life where he had to have faith in God. The particular one that God promised that Abraham was going to be the patriarch of a great nation. God promised Abraham that the great nation of Israel was going to come from, from his lineage and through him. Well, Abraham was what? How old was Abraham? I don't remember. 90 years old. Sarah was 90 years old. Who's having a baby at 90 years old? Who even wants to have a baby at 90 years old, right? But God promised Abraham, it's from you that, that you're going you're gonna to have a child. And so, you going to believe that? If God shows up on knocks on your door, you're 90 years old and says, uh, by the way, you're fixing to have a baby. You just going to take that line down? You just going to say, oh, okay, God, let's do it. No, I mean, come on. Uh, and, but but and first of all, you're not even going to believe it. And if anybody told you that, you're going to tell them they're a kook because it's impossible. And uh, so, but verse 19 says that not being weak in his faith, he did not consider his own body already dead since he was about 100 years old and the deadness of Sarah's womb. He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God. Listen to verse 21. Being fully convinced that what he had promised, he was also able to perform. And so what Abraham said was, if God promised it, God's able to do it because God can do anything. If God has promised me that he can forgive my sin, then he can do it because God is able to do anything. If God has promised me that he can make me righteous, that he can make me worthy of heaven and a relationship with him, then God is the only one who can do it because he can do anything. And when I completely believe only in his promise for my salvation and, and, and stop trying to earn it and stop even believing that I have to earn it, and can simply receive the gift of his righteousness and his salvation because of what his son did. And if I can believe him, then I can be saved. And when I can get to that place, Paul says, starts out in verse 5, therefore, he says, because of all that, when you're justified by faith, you have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. He said, when you're made right with God, through Jesus Christ, through just the grace and the gift of salvation, he says that you have peace with God through him. Here's, here's the deal. Let, let's turn the page over, verses 10 and 11. Well, in my Bible, you have to turn the page over. It might be on the same page in your Bible. Uh, verses 10 and 11. This is what he says. For when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son. And much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. So I want you to notice what these two verses say, what, what they're talking about. They say, before Christ, we were actually enemies of God. Look, you may not feel like an enemy of God, but if you do not, Jesus said, if you're not for me, you're against me. If the scriptures declare, even in Colossians, Paul declares, he talks about how in our minds, in our hearts, we are actually enemies with God. When we are away from God and when we are apart from God, the fact is that we are enemies of God. If we are not for him, then we are uh, against him. He says, but now through Christ, we've been reconciled. That broken relationship, that relationship that had enmity between it, it is now brought back together. It's like a marriage that's been broken, but somehow through a miraculous spiritual thing, the marriage comes back together and the two parties are reconciled. It's like a, 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 a husband, a wife, a father, a child, a mother, a daughter, parents and kids, grandkids, any kind of broken relationship. In order to bring it back together and heal it and mend it, it is reconciled. It is called reconciled. That's where we live. We live in a broken relationship with God. And it's only through Christ Jesus that he reconciles that relationship and he brings us back together. All right? 
So therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now we have peace, we have peace with God. It doesn't say the peace from God. It doesn't, this isn't the peace of God. This isn't the peace that passes all understanding. That's not what this is. This is peace with God. It means that, you know what? That I know that on the day that I have to stand before God, I'm not going to just fry up all at one time. It means that I know that when I stand before God, he is going to open his arms and he is going to say, come on in. Now, again, not based on anything I've done, but based upon just believing his promise and receiving the salvation that he's offered. So therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, because we've been justified and because we have peace, we now have access. Verse 2, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. So I need to talk about, I'm trying to get to rejoicing real quick because this is about joy. But not only do I have peace with God, but listen, now I have access to God. I want you to think about that for a second. You have access to the God who created the heavens and the earth. You have access to the one who said, let there be light, and there was light. You have access to the one who was able to reach down and pick up a handful of dirt and fashion a man and blow the breath of life into his nostrils. You have access to the God who could stand up in the middle of the storm and speak to the waves and speak to the wind and say, peace and be still. And immediately the wind and the waves had to obey him. You have access to the one who could literally take the entire universe and turn it backwards so that the sun went, the sundial, the time went backwards 10 degrees on the sundial uh, uh, in, in answer to a prayer. You have access to the God that there is nothing too difficult for him. We now have complete and we now have full access to God. I want you to think about the story in Luke chapter 15 and it starts, um, I don't know where it starts. It starts in about verse 11. It's the story of the prodigal son, all right? Uh, uh, I, I'm just going to kind of tell the story just a little bit. and uh, But I, I'm really going to focus on, on, on verse. But you know the story of, of of the prodigal son. The man had two sons. One of his sons says, Dad, I want my inheritance. He took his inheritance. He went off. He went off on his own, uh, went into the far country, the scriptures say, started wasting his father's money uh, until he finally had it all. This guy, was, this guy was, he got to a place where he was very despondent. He was extremely despondent. Now look, he didn't have access to the blessings of the father. But I want you to take note of something. It wasn't because the father was withholding the blessings. It was because he left the father. It was because he left the ranch. It was because he separated himself from the father. He himself took himself into the far country. In fact, in that scripture, when he finally, it says that he comes to himself or he comes to his own mind, however it says it, however it says it, however it says it, it says that he, he actually said, you know what? The slaves on my father's farm live better than I do. I won't even ask him to take me back as a son. I'll just ask him to take me back as a slave. I mean, he was, he was in such despondency, but he was away from the blessings of, of the father. He was away. He did not have access to the father, not because the father didn't want it, but because he took himself away. So now we have access to everything about God. Look, let me tell you something. I think it was last week I said this, that you can tell God, no, I don't want you to be a part of my life. And you know what God's going to say? Okay. I don't, I don't want God to be a part of my life. I don't want God suggesting to me what I should do. I don't want God telling me what I should do. I don't want God leading my life. I don't want God guiding my life. I actually don't want God to be a part of my life at all. And God will just say, okay. And then, but then, after we leave the Father, after we go our own way, after we're out there doing our own thing, we have cut ourselves off from access to the Father and the things of the Father. And then we want to get mad at God. Well, God, how come you're not taking care of me? Well, God, how come you're not doing this for me? Well, God, how come you're not doing that for me? God, I thought you were this all-loving, graceful God showering gifts and blessings on everyone. Yeah, but you got to be on the farm. you got to be on the farm. 
you got to be in relationship with the Father so that you can have access to Him. If you tell Him goodbye, leave and go to the far country, don't expect that God can just pour those blessings out on you in the far country because He can't. Not because He can't, but because you've left. You're gone. We want to totally neglect God in our lives and then blame Him for everything that He doesn't do for us. It, you can't have it both ways. You just can't. If you don't want God to be a part of your life, then don't get mad when he says, okay, I won't. Now, it's all right. You don't have to say amen. It really is all right. But here, listen, look. So he didn't have access because he left the Father. In all my years in Bible school, I never heard a lesson about the prodigal son's brother. I, I, I've never, I don't know that I've ever heard a sermon about the prodigal son's brother. But I actually loved the little encounter with his older brother, the one who stayed home. Because I'm going to let you in on a little secret. He was missing access as well. He was still on the farm. And if you remember the story in Luke chapter 15, you know, he heard the commotion going on at the house, and he asked one of the workers, he said, what's going on at home? He said, your brother came home. We're having a big party. Your father's killed the fatted calf. Come on. Come on, man. It's a party. Your dad's having a party. Well, he'd swole all up. That's the Brother Keith version. That's not the way the Bible says. But he swole all up. He wouldn't go. He got mad. Dad gets in the pickup, drives out into the pasture, and he goes to the older son. He says, what is going on? Your brother is home. Let, and he says to his dad, he says, Dad, listen, you can read. I know I'm giving you the Brother Keith version, but you read it and see if this isn't exactly what it says. He says, Dad, I never left you. I stayed here all the time. I've done everything you wanted me to do. I've worked this farm, and I've worked for you, and I've just been here, and I've been your best son. I've done everything that I've needed to do to be your best son. You've never given me anything. You've never offered me any little calf that I could butcher and have a party with my friends. You've never given me anything. And the dad looks at him and says, Son, everything I have belongs to you. He says, don't you get it? Everything that's mine is yours. Everything that I have belongs to you. But he was missing access to all of that as well. He was still on the farm, but he thought he had to earn everything. You don't gain access to the Father because you earn it. You don't gain access to the things of God because you deserve it. You gain access to the Father because you are justified by faith through the Lord Jesus Christ. You gain access to the Father because it's by grace. And if, if, if we want God to be a part of our lives, the opportunity is there waiting for us. The reconciliation happens through His Son, Jesus, and the death, burial, and the resurrection. And so now, because we have this access, He says we can rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. You see, now I can find some joy because whatever else happens, here's what I know. I know that I'm accepted by God. Again, it's not because I'm a good person, because I'm not. It's not because I've done anything to deserve it any more than anybody else, because I have it. It's because of the grace of God and me believing that what God has promised, he's able to do. And he's promised me eternal life, and I believe that he's capable of giving it to me. So now... Because, because I believe that, I can, have, I can have hope. I can rejoice in, 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 in the hope of the glory of God because I know that he's at work. Because I know that he can take care of every situation. 
Because I know that he can walk with me through every situation. Because I know that he can strengthen me. I know that he can change a situation. I know that there's nothing that's too difficult for him. I also know that he knows what I don't know. He sees the beginning from the end. He sees around the next corner. He can see tomorrow, next week, next year, uh, a decade from now. He knows what really needs to be done even better than I do. He knows what needs to be done. He knows how to get it done. And so there he is. And so I can find joy in that. Even when the circumstances may make me sad, I can find joy in knowing that it is not catching God off guard and God is going to be able to take care of anything that he needs to take care of. And so then he goes on to say, not only that, but we glory in tribulations. And what he's saying here is, well, we also rejoice in our tribulations. We rejoice in our tribulations because we know that tribulation produces perseverance and perseverance character and character, again, comes back to giving us hope. James chapter 1, verses uh, 2 through 8, famous passage where he says, count it all joy, my brothers, when you enter into uh, different trials. Uh, knowing that the trying of your faith produces perseverance, produces character, uh, and, and those things. So he's talking about counting it all joy when we face difficult times. Counting it all joy when your heart is breaking. Counting it all joy when you don't understand what's going on. Counting it all joy when everything is out of your control. Finding, how can I do that? Let me, let me just tell you this. And I can't figure out if, well, that doesn't even matter. What I can't figure out doesn't matter, right? Uh, but look, listen to me. You can't run around and claim Romans 8, 28, for all things work together for good for those who are the called according to his, for those who love God and who are the called according to his purposes. You can't run around and claim Romans 8, 28 if you don't claim Romans chapter 5, verse 3, we glory in our tribulations also. Because that is what Romans 8.28 is all about. We know that all things work together for good, for those who are the, uh, love God, for those who are the called according to his purposes. How do we know that we're, they're good? How do we know that everything is good? How do we know that everything can work together and come out good? We know that only because we know that God is working in us to produce something inside of us, to mold us, and to make us into who he wants us to be. We glory in those tribulations because we know that those tribulations produce in us a perseverance, a staying power, and that perseverance produces in us a character. It's a completeness. It's a maturity. It is that God is working in our life, making us into who he wants us to be. You can't claim one of these without living the other one. You can't do it. They are inextricably linked. The reason that all things work together is because God is using that trial to produce perseverance and character within our lives. And so if we believe in Romans 8, 28, then we're going to take joy in our trials and tribulations. Try that next time. I'm serious. It's not going to be the first thought in your mind. I'm going to tell you that right now. When whatever it is that's going on that's bringing uh, heartache or heartbreak or sadness into your life, your first thought isn't going to be, well, I just need to have some joy in the Lord. Yes, sir. That's all right. I wouldn't have called on you if I didn't want you to speak. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's, I, I ain't saying, in fact, that's exactly what I'm saying. You're going to have trials. You're going to have hard times. The question is, how are we going to respond to those? Yes. Paul goes on to this, and he talks about the struggle between the spirit and the flesh. Uh, and you can go on and read, uh, if you want to read in Romans, he talks about that struggle and that battle all the time. He often says, look, what I want to do, I don't do. What I don't want to do, that's what I find myself doing. There is a real struggle. You are going to have trials. And, and that's exactly what I'm saying. And the question is, are we going to be able to find some joy in those trials? Are we going to be able to do some rejoicing in those trials? 
because we know that it's in those trials that God is working inside of us. He is producing us this perseverance. He is completing his character. He is making us complete as he works on us and works in him. And again, all things work together for good to those who love God, who are the called according to his purposes. Yes, I believe that's true. And I only believe it's true because I believe that in those trials and in those, because it doesn't say everything is good, in those things that are not good, that God is working to do the work that he needs to do in our lives. And so he says, you know what? You need to rejoice in that. You need to find, be able to find some joy in that. We need to be able to uh, find some joy. And so, and then, uh, so then the perseverance produces the character, and the character brings us back to hope because we know that God is working, and hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. So finally, we can rejoice in the Spirit. Look, what's the second, what's the second listed fruit of the Spirit? Joy, love, joy. It's a fruit of the Spirit. What do I say about fruit? Does anybody remember? I probably hadn't said it enough. Fruit is the natural product of a healthy plant planted in healthy soil. It's a natural. You can't make fruit happen. You can't make the fruit of the Spirit happen. You can't do it. What has to happen is, is that you have to be a healthy plant planted in healthy soil growing in a healthy way. In other words, you have to be in a right relationship with God living in him. And he's, we're doing this work through these trials. You're rejoicing. He's developing your character. And in this character, it's producing a hope. And the hope doesn't disappoint us because God's love is poured into us by his spirit that was freely given to us. And so now that spirit that lives inside of us produces this fruit of joy within itself and on its own. Look, We've got, we've got to find some joy. We can't live our lives in despair. We can't live our lives every time something doesn't go our way, we just think the world is coming to an end. Every time something doesn't go our way, we just want to, you know, turn out the lights. I mean, we can't live our lives with that kind of despair. We have to be able, because those, that darkness is going to come, trust me. It's going to come. It's going to happen to you. Your heart is going to be broken beyond what you can imagine. You are going to face something, you know, we always like to say, God's never going to put anything more than you can stand. That's a lie. I'm telling you, that's a lie. It's not in the Bible. What it says is that God will not tempt you. It's talking about temptation. It's not saying that God won't put anything in life circumstances. In fact, the truth of the matter is, I can promise you that he will put on you, you more than you can take. You know why? It will require you to depend upon him. It will require you to have faith in him. It will require you to turn yourself back to him and to find your strength in him. Stand up with me. Go ahead and stand up with me if you would. Look, I, we can't live in this darkness. We can't live in this despair. It's not what God wants for us. We have got to find some joy. And that joy is only going to start when we come into a right relationship with him. Being justified by faith through the Lord Jesus Christ being declared righteous by God, not because of what we've done, but because of what he's promised. And when I can get a hold of that, I can start down this path that's going to lead me to a life of joy. And that's what we need. we got to have it. Listen, if you need to come uh, forward uh, for any reason this morning, I want to ask you to do it. Look, I want to give you something to pray about uh, while you're there. Uh, and you th Miss, Miss Thelma's cousin, uh, what, what is her? June Pendergrass, she's got some cancer. We're just going to pray, join in agreement with Miss Thelma that God would uh, heal her. Miss Clyda Cooley got some bad news about her eye uh, this week. Not sure exactly what it is. Possible cancer, though. Just pray for her. Uh, so you be in prayer, if nothing else. If you're not considering a decision, if the Lord isn't speaking to your heart, then you be in prayer during this time. If you need to make a decision for the Lord during this time, you come and you make it. Stop trying to make yourself right with God. Because you ain't never going to get there. You ain't ever getting there. Receive the gift of salvation that he offers to you.